I want to tell you guys a story. When I was a kid, the number one thing that I wanted to be was a game designer. I felt like that was the thing that I was destined to be, even more so than a writer. It was definitely more than wanting to get into animation, which was a passion that would only come up years later. Video games were my favorite medium, and to this day, they kind of still are. Although, other loves have cropped up as you may or may not have been able to tell. That dream has had a lot of ups and downs. At one point, I even took a stab at making my own video game, something I dubbed as Epic, the humorous RPG, which turned out to be, um... What are you doing here? Uh, let, let, let's just, uh, leave him be then. Not the best. Yeah, despite my interest, I wasn't very good at the actual nitty-gritty of designing and making video games. I mean, the most telling thing about it is that it's an RPG that parodies the conventions of your typical JRPG, from a person who does not and did not play JRPGs. The humor was inspired by a webcomic that I was into at the time called Adventurers. I don't even know if it's still online, but looking back, it probably wasn't as good as I thought it was. It had very crude arts and very basic humor, but it had its charm. However, despite how it turned out, I don't regret going out of my way in making this game. The game itself is terrible. I've even played through most of it on this channel, if you want to see it for yourself. It's not the game itself that I cherish to this day, but the experience of actually going out of my way and seeing something to the end. While it's not a complete game in the sense of the word, it is about an hour of content leading up to a climax where you fight a boss. It does have a definitive end point, which is not something I could say about a lot of my projects. It was the very first time that I actually challenged myself to learn how to code, and really tested myself to actually accomplish something, to actually finish something. I still remember my experiences making this game, and the challenges that I came across in making it. Something very important was born within me when I made that game. It's something that taught me about really caring about a project and seeing it to the end. Even though the end result I'm not too proud of, I wouldn't trade its existence for anything in the world. We all make mistakes, and from them, we learn. In an ideal world, we take these mistakes, and we get better. The next game that I make is probably going to be better than this. It's a sad state of affairs when your earlier works happen to be the best that you've ever created. It means that you're past your peak, and it's all downhill from there. And that brings us to today's subject extra credits. I thought long and hard about whether I wanted to do this review or not, for a variety of reasons. And probably not the reasons that you think. If you're wondering, I don't have any rules against reviewing this particular series as an animated atrocity. If I counted Troll as an animation, I can certainly count this. And I have stated that I can review web series if their flaws are based on factual information, or they give out information that could actually lead to harm. The reason that I was hesitant to review this particular series, and its more recent blunders, is because because this series was actually a huge part of my adolescence. I had actually been following this series since before it was called Extra Credits. It started as an unnamed series. One of its creators, Daniel Floyd, had made a video on video games and storytelling for his art history course in university, and he had uploaded it to YouTube in 2008. Over the course of the next few years, he would make seven more of these videos, eventually joining up with a game designer named James Portnow. They could be seen as pilots to the main Extra Credits series, with cruder art and a vastly different microphone and audio effects. One of the videos that they did during this time was on the Uncanny Valley, and let's just say that it's kind of hilarious in hindsight comparing their show now to their show then. These videos came out once every few months, and I thought that they were great. 2008 was a very different time in the world. Video games were taken sort of seriously, but as an entertainment medium. Back then, no one really saw them as deserving of high study. Most people didn't think that they were really art. They weren't a children's pastime anymore, but they were still seen as a time waster by most mainstream audiences. Taking a video game seriously at the time would have been seen like taking a roller coaster seriously at the time. You have to understand that this series started before Jack Thompson's disbarment. The only people who considered video games as a serious matter at the time were people who spent a lot of time playing games, and not just the mainstream ones. Games like Okami, Psychonauts, or the Quintet games were invisible to even mainstream gaming audiences at the time. Needless to say, there was a palatable joy coming across someone taking video games this seriously, having a real, thoughtful discussion about the good that video games could do. However, the video releases were slow and staggered. Dan put out only eight 
videos in the time span of two years. And I thought this would end up with the same fate as many internet series. Lost the sands of time, because the creators thought that the internet wasn't for them or they moved on to something else. DEMONS! I know that story all too well. However, I was in for a big surprise on July 21st of 2010. I will always remember that date. On that day, Dan had announced that his series was picked up by The Escapist, and was going to turn into a weekly series entitled Extra Credits, hosted by Dan, written by James, and featuring their new artist Allison Page. And it would begin within a week. I remember the date that this was announced because by some crazy coincidence, July 21st is my birthday. And if that's not enough for you, 2010 was the year I turned 18. Throughout my early adulthood, I watched the series religiously for years and years. However, in the recent few, things have grown sour between me and the show. Yeah, believe it or not, this short series of videos isn't going to be about that one video. You know, the one that everyone in the grandmother already responded to? There you are, playing the PvP in your World War II shooter, and all of the sudden, you're a Nazi. You didn't ask for this. You didn't choose this. Yet there it is. And it's treated no differently than playing a British soldier. At least, it's not going to be about just that video. That video was the apex of several years of decay, and I think it's important to talk about all of the decay, not just the one final explosion. At this point in my life, I'm no stranger to disappointment in my former idols, as more and more of them are revealed to be terrible people in some way, shape, or form, or their content decays into garbage, or they turn into the villains that they once rallied against. But usually, it's just one explosive incident, one slip of the mask that reveals everything to be a sham. It's not usually years and years of watching things fall apart and trying to ignore them as they do fall apart. Let's just say that I am doing this video with a heavy heart. One of the more common critiques about extra credits is that at the start, they seem to be on the side of the video gaming audience, the consumers, demanding more quality and more responsibility from big publishers and big developers. This was stated amazingly well in their open letter to EA Marketing, where they read one of EA's founding messages and juxtaposed it towards their modern-day advertising, showing how far that EA had fell. It was a brilliant move, and that video still holds up to this day. In recent years, though, Extra Credits has criticized for becoming more and more corporate, and defending the shady practices of developers and corporations. One of their more infamous examples is in the video that states that games should not cost $60 anymore, but even more. In this episode, they try and justify the practice of big corporations putting microtransactions, loot boxes, and DLC in general in games that are at their full retail price of $60. It's a badly made video, and it's as good a place as any to start. Their main argument in this video is that video games have gotten more expensive over the years, and the price of video games has not risen with inflation. Triple A games have costed $60 since before he even started his series. These aren't really arguments when you boil them down. They are justifications. Justifications for bad habits. And it doesn't really understand the basic realities of economics. The video seems to be under the logic that it's the consumer's duty to support an industry. This is not how business works. It is the industry, any industry, not just video games, it is their duty to sell a product the consumers want at a price that they can afford. If they can't do that, then they fail and it is not the consumer's fault or responsibility. The video tries to make a case for one thing, but in the end it makes the case that the AAA industry is filled with bloat. The arguments don't hold water when you could easily point to counterexamples both within and without the industry, of corporations making a lot of money without these shady practices in full price products. The price of a movie, for instance, hasn't risen in many years. Your average DVD will cost $20 to $25, and the only thing that seems to raise that price is a major formatting change, from DVD to Blu-ray, or from standard to widescreen. Meanwhile, AAA movies get exponentially more expensive to produce, and the audience for movies has not grown nearly as much as the audience for video games in the past decade. Meanwhile, within the games industry, you have companies like Nintendo. They pull out blockbuster after blockbuster, huge, expansive games, Mario Odyssey, Breath of the Wild, Super Smash Brothers, all without practices like loot boxes that are increasingly getting determined as unethical. The video makes the argument that better graphics are one of the reasons why prices need to go up, and yet Pokemon, which still uses the models that they made for Generation 6, is the most profitable media franchise in the entire world. Minecraft is one of the best-selling games of all time, and Stardew Valley is one of the highest-ranking games out there, none of which are graphical powerhouses. The secret to making a lot of money with a video game isn't technical bloat and higher graphics. It's making gameplay that's interesting. The kind of logic that the video gives leads to trend chasing. This video is filled with the same arguments that people used to shoehorn in multiplayer to games that didn't need them in the wake of Call of Duty, or open world in the wake of Minecraft, 
or Battle Royale in the wake of Fortnite and PUBG. If we don't put in this thing that costs millions of dollars, that our game does not need, that our audience does not want, then it will fail! The biggest catastrophic failures in any media comes from a few places in general. Number one, false or bad marketing, like with No Man's Sky or Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. By the way, about half of a AAA game's budget is done on marketing. Marketing the AAA games that have brand recognition probably don't need, while their employees are overworked and underpaid. Number two is trend chasing. Also, there are these yearly releases of franchises to squeeze every single penny out of them as the interest and the quality of said franchises decay. These are arguments that people have used against this extra credits video before, but there's something else in this video that rubbed me the wrong way, that I don't think anyone else has brought up, and I want to see if you can figure out the issue here. By not raising prices, we've sort of put ourselves in a tough spot. If we are going to cover our development costs, reduce the risk of catastrophic losses, and show our shareholders the return percentages they're expecting, we've got to do something to increase revenue. Did you hear that? He starts speaking in the first person. He doesn't refer to the developers or the industry like he usually does, or like he did towards the start of the video, and that changes the context of everything. Think of the video restructured to have that first-person language throughout the entire thing. You should buy this video game at $90 or I will disappoint my shareholders. It might have been bad grammar or it might have been a Freudian slip, but it changes the context of the entire video. I can ignore or look past one video as I did with this initially, but it's harder to do so with them defending something like loot boxes in a two-part series. And these videos almost came back to back. It was a hard time to stay subscribed to this channel. For those who don't know, loot boxes are a type of microtransaction in a video game. You usually buy them with real-world money, and the reward you get out of it is completely random. It may be something you want, it could be something you already have, or it could be totally worthless. You might be asking yourself, how is that not gambling? Well... Why are all of these $60 games trying to sell me loot boxes? Why are all these $60 games selling me season passes for their DLC? Why are all of these $60 games including microtransactions? Why are all of these $60 games trying to sell me DLC on day one? There are many variations, but the fundamental question being asked is the same. Why are they trying to make me pay more than $60 for this game? Today, we are going to answer that question. This video starts off with using first-person language, which is some kind of improvement, but when people say they've sold out or gone more corporate, this is generally what they mean. The people who watched Extra Credits when it first came out saw them as on the side of the consumers, speaking for them, and making many episodes outright critiquing the gaming industry, or their more dubious practices like using Skinner boxes. Operant conditioning works on humans. Simply rewarding someone every time they do an action isn't the best way to keep them continually doing that action. Rather, if you provide a reward to a person after they perform the action a random number of times, or only give a reward once every so many minutes, these methods are far more effective at conditioning someone to repeat an action. Let's just say you should keep that episode in mind. Talking about their loot boxes episode, though, I have no other way to say this, but what they say and the attitude they portray in these videos is just literally disgusting. Loot box content is generally far less expensive to produce than DLC or expansions, and the possibility for duplicates inevitably means that players will end up purchasing more content than the devs actually make. What hurts the most is that you say that like it's a good thing. In what world does it sound moral or good that you've essentially tricked a person into buying the same thing twice. Even ignoring the moral quandaries. A duplicate something is not more content. The player cannot purchase more content than the developers make. That is a logical impossibility. Duplicate content is not more content, it is the same content that they are buying over and over again. Some players being willing to spend hundreds of dollars on these games is what makes it easier for the industry to sell these games at the more affordable $60 price. I'm going to stop you right there because you say a lot wrong in very few words. What he's talking about is whales. Yes, this is an actual industry term. This is what the industry actually calls people who spend a lot of money on microtransaction models. And when I say a lot of money, it's not hundreds as Dan or James or whoever puts it. It's thousands. You see, this isn't usually talked about within the video games industry because whales legitimately have a psychological problem that the industry takes advantage of. By definition, no healthy sane person spends hundreds of dollars on a microtransaction model. And the people most vulnerable to loot boxes have something called gambling addiction. In these videos, Extra Credits claim that because you don't get anything that is a real-world value, by the legal definition, it's not 
not gambling. You know, because it's not legally defined as a problem, then it's not a problem. The argument is disgusting, and it shows how much they do not understand the issue of addiction, or compulsion, or whatever they want to call it. Gambling addiction is a very serious problem in some people. The stereotype of a gambling addict is someone who just stands at a slot machine all day, losing all of their money. The reality is actually a lot more sad. A loss encourages a gambling addict to keep playing. If they don't get what they want, they feel like they need an even bigger hit to break even. They'll keep driving themselves further and further into destitution, because any small hit is never enough for them. And the way casinos work, the way they make money, is never enough for a gambler to really break even. And like any other addiction, you need a bigger and a bigger dose in order to be satisfied. Gambling addiction can be more difficult to manage than other addictions as well. A drug addict can get the hit that they want, but in gambling, the house always wins. Casinos are rigged so that they do not lose money, even with the very rare big payouts that a gambling addict will generally never receive. It doesn't matter if you don't earn real-world money or a real-world benefit for gambling with the video game's loot boxes. Actually, that makes it worse in a sense. In terms of loot boxes, the winnings that a gambling addict gets from them still belong to the house. At least with a traditional slot machine, there is a chance that a gambling addict can get something that they can use somewhere else. But no, when it comes to loot boxes, even when the gambling addict wins, they still lose. I don't know how fair it is to critique this video for this, but years later, nowadays, we're seeing stories of people with real problems spending upwards of $50,000 on in-game loot boxes. Kids spending money because they can't differentiate that the currency in-game costs real-world money. And as for your justification, most people who aren't gambling addicts don't like loot boxes in their game as well. It destroyed any appeal to Battlefront 2, and in a game like RuneScape, it completely wrecked the in-game economy because of the occasional payout. Oh, by the way, RuneScape is a particularly egregious example of this. Every day, they'll give you two keys for free. You know, like drug dealers giving you your first hit for free. And they'll only stop you from buying microtransactions once you've hit $5,000 per month. And that's not for the consumer's benefit. That's just to stop fraud. And they're still doing this, even though they were critiqued and specifically called out by the UK government. It is really disgusting. It is just one of the most shady practices in consumer history. There is a reason that countries are banning these things. They are gambling in every sense of the word. Using the legal definition argument is more or less a fallacy. And even worse, these loot box gambling machines are usually in games that are accessible to minors. Battlefront 2? Rated T. RuneScape? Rated T. Many of the free-to-play games? They're rated E. And the cherry on top of the sundae here is that Extra Credits has done videos on both Skinner Boxes and the Sunk Cost Fallacy. So, there really is only one of two options I can see here. Either they're playing stupid, or they're not playing. First, you'll hear some claiming that these games are preying on children, trying to get them to spend tens of thousands of their parents' money, but this is actually very rare. Many of the free app games with the sole desire of using free-to-play monetization methods are aimed directly at children. The only reason you need to be 13 years or older to even join RuneScape is because of legislation. There's an important distinction between gambling and non-gambling, and that is the ability to cash out. Right. Someone spending extra money on a video game has no real-world investment into that video game. When you assign monetary price to something, it does have a real-world monetary price. What are you talking about? But speaking of cashing out, one of the prizes with RuneScape's loot boxes is in-game currency. With that in-game currency, you can buy a membership bond, which will give you increased features in the game. You can also buy that membership with real-world money. It is possible in RuneScape to cash out from your loot boxes. Because you can't take your rare Overwatch skin and sell it back to Blizzard for actual spending money, except in many games like CSGO, or RuneScape, there are third-party black markets for in-game materials, where you can spend actual money to buy other people's winnings, or sell them. A CSGO skin sold for $60,000. Video game loot boxes are less like craps and roulette, and more akin to a crane game, or a blind box, or the raffle for prizes at the county fair. You're really defending loot boxes via crane games. You know that they're scams, right? Pretty much every single one of them is artificially rigged to only give you out a prize very rarely, and they intentionally drop it every other time. Is this really what you want to compare loot boxes to? When, with a loot box, you can basically do the crane game thing much more efficiently. Also, he's making his arguments based on one study that he doesn't even link to. Back before important people took this issue seriously. This requires a lot more serious study. I've seen 
seen a number of psychologists voice their personal opinions, some saying, of course it's gambling, others saying, of course it's not gambling, but really it just reinforces the point. We need to actually scientifically look into this, and on a large scale. Absolutely, I agree. And yet you're arguing that we should go absolutely crazy with loot boxes and should be okay with them before we have any of this actual study done. That, that's an interesting point. When designed ethically, the loot box model allows rich folks to pay more money so the game stays affordable for the rest of us, and that is alright by me. Counterpoint! Rich people are probably going to be able to afford many more games and have access to a wider library, and thus are less likely to be exposed to loot box microtransaction models. But even so, let's assume that it's just rich people doing this. Getting people to spend money on nothing, on literal nothing, is wrong. The Extra Credits episode is very pro loot box, even though he states that there needs to be research on loot boxes, like a massive amount of study. That mystifies me, like legitimately mystifies me. In any other case, would you say that something needs a massive amount of study, but you're okay to just go along doing that thing? before the massive amount of study is completed. It really doesn't add up unless you don't care if it hurts people or not. People who spend thousands of dollars on video game slot machines, rich or not, have a mental problem. And by the way, people who spend the hundreds or thousands of dollars on these video games, they're generally not rich. Rich people generally don't fall into traps like this to lose all of their money. That's why they're still rich. It really seems like you just don't care about people who have gambling compulsion. But I thought that you and your team cared about marginalized people. And then there's all the games that take place in a mental hospital or some other type of mental health institution designed to instill fear in players. You do know that sanitariums have a grisly history, right? At least in the United States. From ones ran by people like John Harvey Kellogg, who thought the greatest way to start the day was with a yogurt enema, to the four sterilizations that were performed up to the 1970s. But we'll be getting to that video and a few others next time. We gotta talk about how much they care about gambling addicts. Sorry, those who are compelled to gamble. The outcry around Star Wars Battlefront kicked quite the hornet's nest. Even major non-gaming news outlets picked up the story, and as soon as that happened, politicians jumped on the bandwagon, seeing an easy way to score some political points. And if you're not a fan of the loot box monetization model, that's probably been pretty exciting to see, which I can understand. But if I may pump the brakes just a little bit, we should probably at least consider the potential consequences of what we're asking for. They go on to say that games with loot boxes should not be kept away from kids, because video games are art. He goes on to compare it to when the government tried to ban minors from listening to explicit music. However, I want to give an argument from the other side here. This video starts out by talking about Star Wars Battlefront 2, a game that was criticized because it locked the most popular Star Wars characters like Darth Vader behind loot boxes, or more grinding than anyone with a healthy schedule could accomplish. Imagine if Darth Vader were a prize in a slot machine, or Luke Skywalker was on a billboard telling people to gamble. You know, Dan... Joe Camel was a piece of art too. Propaganda, technically speaking, is art, which also includes commercials, which we have very strict rules about how they're aimed at minors. The video makes several confused arguments. If loot boxes were declared gambling, people who played loot box games would be liable for illegal gambling. What never seems to cross the Extra Credits team's mind is that there is the reality that loot boxes do not need to be in video games. At all. All of his arguments here just fall apart when you realize the reality that loot boxes do not need to be in video games. A video game can exist without microtransactions. It might not be as big or as shiny as it could be, but video games do exist without microtransactions, even the big budget ones. Microtransaction games have avoided the gambling label because the system doesn't allow you to cash out. Except you can. In many video games, there are third-party economies for in-game goods, ones that have led to significant problems. Sorry if I'm repeating myself, it's just very repetitive arguments, like hearing someone justify, for lack of a better word, an addiction over and over and over again. But I want to call out his specific argument here. He states that game corporations have dodged the gambling quotes since Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering is a very baffling example because it's a physical product. You automatically cash out on that one. At any point, I can sell any trading card that I have. It's possible with Magic the Gathering to get super lucky and get a super rare card, which could be valued for a lot of money. This effectively made your purchase of a loot box or a booster pack less like placing your chips on red and more like buying a raffle ticket. Because no one has ever won a prize in a raffle that had any real-world value. Oh, by the way, in the United States, the IRS 
counts raffles as gambling, several religions prevent you from participating in raffles because they see them as gambling, and several US states do not allow general people to host raffles because they consider them as gambling. His next argument is that one of the effects of declaring loot boxes gambling is that things that you purchase that cost money will actually have the value of money. This is a problem that has entrenched itself into a lot of digital infrastructure, and it's going to cause a lot of problems that I covered in another series of videos of mine called Technocracy, specifically the one on digital distribution. But he goes on to say that this would make companies more hesitant to ban people who spend a lot of money on a game for legal reasons. However, I have a counterpoint. Even if the legal language stays the same, that what you buy in a video game is not your real world stuff and has no value, do you really think that companies are going to be just as quick to ban the player who is spending thousands of dollars on their game than the player who is spending nothing or next to nothing? You said it yourself in the last part. The game could not exist as is without those kind of players. So why would companies ban people who are making their game exist at all? Will companies be even more hesitant to ban that one horribly toxic guy who's dropped 200k on the game because they know they'll be legally responsible for destroying 200k worth of that person's property. Did you hear that? Listen to that again. It's another little sneaky trick of language. In the last episode, Dan here was saying that he didn't mind rich people spending a couple of hundred dollars on the free games that he played. But when you change that number to 200k, it sounds like an entirely different argument. Dan, would you still be okay if someone was conned out of $200,000 to play a game, if that means that you got to play it for free? Either people only spend up to a couple hundred bucks on microtransactions and loot boxes, or they can spend up to 200 k or more. It can only be one or the other. You've used two contradictory arguments. Even ignoring all this, things in video games do have real-world value that people have been able to pin down and actually calculate. Back in 2014, there was a war in an MMO called EVE Online, which is basically a space simulator game. Ships that people paid real money for were engaged in that war, and the entire battle had a real-world price tag of, well, coincidentally, $200,000. To this day, it is the most expensive real-world loss in a video game. It's not like this stuff is totally unprecedented. And what about the gold earned legitimately by players during the hours you're gonna have to roll back? I'm going to sound really, really harsh right now, but that's not the consumer's problem, that is the industry's problem, and they deserve any consequence that they get. Here's an idea for you. Maybe your next episode should be about future-proofing, because that's something that the industry really seems to need to learn. Back in the day, it used to be considered a bad idea to engage in a practice if you did not know all of the legal ramifications of said practice. These are questions that should have been answered long before you ever started selling digital goods. Any issue caused by this is your own, because you are not able to look towards the future. I know that seems like a silly question, but it does provide companies an easy way to circumvent loot box laws. I get you, Dan. We should never create any laws for any corporation ever, because they will always find a way around it, so it's pointless to even try. Is it gambling if I make you pay a dollar every time you try to do a raid? But not gambling if I charge you $35 to be able to do the raid as often as you want. Okay, I ha I have to stop. You, you seriously don't know the difference here, or how the first is worse than the latter. Paying $1 for one try is infinitely worse than paying $35 for infinite tries. It's just math. The second you're on try number 36, it's all sunshine and roses from there on. Beyond that, it removes the temptation to keep pulling the slots, to keep paying into a system that is taking advantage of you. Imagine a casino where you only need to pay for access and you do not need to pay for any of the slot machines. It'd be ludicrous because it's obviously not gambling. And beyond that, it puts control back into the hands of players. That should absolutely be the way it is. I don't think anyone is against randomness in general in video games, which is what you seem to be arguing here. There's a clear distinction between these two examples that you're trying to conflate, even though they're not equivalent. I get it. We need to be careful about how we wear these laws, and we do need to think about the implications of any law that we decide to make. They can have long-reaching consequences and terrible things have been done in the name of fixing a problem quickly. But you make it seem like even trying is a bad idea. That just asking for regulation is a bad idea. And through all of this, you seem to not have a respect for the actual problem. I mean, I can tear apart each one of your arguments and your justifications. From the art perspective, you argue that these video games are art, which is true, but don't loot boxes kind of ruin the art? You use the example of explicit lyrics in music, but the artists wanted to put the explicit lyrics in their music. The studios did not force them to do it for monetary gain or to take advantage of the consumers. 
I don't think any of the artists behind Overwatch or Battlefield 2 or RuneScape wanted their stuff marred and hated or made unpopular by microtransactions. Take a look at RuneScape's subreddit and see how people are feeling about what used to be a pretty good game that they really cared about because of the overuse of microtransactions. When it comes down to it, microtransactions are just another chapter in the long story of businesses not caring about the art. Your arguments are bad. I don't have any other way to say it. And they fail because of one simple fact. No one is forcing games to have loot boxes in them. And your arguments about game pricing and inflation do not hold water because that is not how business works. And it also kind of fails when so many games are panned because of loot boxes and the shady microtransaction model. And even with them, Many businesses are suffering from massive layoffs or just completely going out of business. What these videos argue for is that the AAA model in general is unsustainable and it needs to crash or change. If you can't raise the price, which you've argued is impossible, then you need to cut costs. That's what you've argued for. Not just now, but in the past. You've argued in the past that gamers don't need true-to-life graphics, and they don't. Some video games need high-fidelity graphics, but there are plenty of games that are absolutely beautiful through other tricks that don't cost as much money, like going with aesthetics. And there's much more appeal to certain types of games than just really shiny graphics. One of your very first videos stated that aesthetics is generally the better way to go, because with years and years of time, they still look better in hindsight. Meanwhile, when you go with realism, the graphics that you're spending billions of dollars on this year will look out of date by the next. Your argument amounts to the industry is bloated. Not one of these things is a good argument for monetization models like loot boxes. It's just an argument that the AAA industry needs to scale back if it's going to survive. And yeah, that's what I agree with. No one really wants a yearly release for even their favorite franchises. It's also hard to claim that loot boxes are the answer to money problems when games like Battlefront 2 are blasted and fail because of them. As we go on, I'm feeling quite tired. But believe it or not, we're actually only half done. Because, in essence, Extra Credits has gained two massive problems over the year. The first one, we've dealt with this time. It's basically how they sold out. I don't like using those words. It sounds like a cliche, pretentious, hipster thing to say. I barely even know what selling out means anymore. But if there's anything in the world that I know to my heart has sold out, it would be the Extra Credits team. They started by standing up for consumers and taking corporations to task when the time came for it. And now, here they are, defending some of the most shady practices that have come out in recent years. And I can only assume that it's because they're in the club. They're popular with the industry. They have context that they don't want to lose. Next time, we get to talk about the much more fun topic of politics, and how once upon a time, they stood up for video games as a medium for artistic expression. And now they think what people can and can't do with a video game, which they dub as art, should be strictly regulated and limited. If not personally, then by the community. Hold on to your podiums and ties, ladies and gentlemen, because it's gonna be a very bumpy ride. Ta